Okay, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm joined by Harry Kramer, who's Professor of Management and Strategy at Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management. How are you doing, Harry? Very good. How are you, John? Excellent. And, and where are you physically located today, Harry? Uh, today I'm in uh, Wilmette, Illinois, about uh, a mile and a half from Northwestern University, which is in uh, Evanston, Illinois. Excellent, excellent. And I'm here in lovely San Diego, as usual. Uh, okay, so what we wanted to talk about is values-based leadership. And so, Harry, let's baseline this from, from the get-go. Um, what do you mean by values-based leadership, and how, does that, uh, how is that different from other forms of leadership? Sure. Uh, my view, John, and I always say no answers, opinions. I really believe if somebody is going to be a leader, what that really means is that you're going to be able to influence others. And the only way you can influence others is to relate to others. And if you want to build a longstanding organization, not something really quick, I think most people expect the leader to have values, to be able to have trust, integrity, uh, so that you're excited about doing something with that person because you know during times of difficulty, they'll do the right thing. And how does how does a leader demonstrate this? Because a lot of people, will, you know, a lot of leaders will sort of say, "Oh yes, you know, that's the kind of person I am." But how does how do the people you are leading? How do they see and hear and know that you are that type of person? I think, John, it, it actually all starts with the ability, in my mind, to be self reflective. And I look at it as that anybody that's in a leadership role, as you well know, they got a lot to do. There's more to do than they can possibly do. And there's this desire, John, to go faster and faster. And I always describe it as, have we started to confuse activity and productivity? Or are we moving so fast, we have no idea how productive we are. Let's just keep moving. And I think the very first thing that a value-based leader does is take the time, get off by themselves, turn off the noise, and ask a couple of fairly basic questions. Questions like, what are my values? What's my purpose? What really matters? What kind of a leader do I want to be? What kind of example do I want to set for other people? I'm not capable of thinking about those things, John, when I'm doing 10 other things at the same time. Yeah, and uh, absolutely. Uh, and then in some ways, what you're describing there, though, is kind of going counter to the pervasive culture that we live in today, where uh, I think people are, are less reflective uh, because they can't switch off the noise and because they get so consumed in activity and in all these narcissistic devices that are demanding their attention all the time. So this is something that you have to be very deliberate about, isn't it, actually, to really separate yourself to be reflective? Because, as I said, it, it's almost counter to the pervasive culture. Absolutely, John. Absolutely. And finding ways. I do this with my students uh, at Northwestern. I did this while I was the CEO of Baxter International, a large global healthcare company. You have to find a way, John, to get away from the noise. And the way I've done this is that for many, many years now, I take 15 minutes, right? We've got a lot to do. This can't be continuous. 15 minutes at the end of the day. And every day, John, I go through, usually around midnight before I turn in, a personal self-examination, okay? And that personal self-examination, I ask myself a lot of questions. What did I say I was going to do today? What did I actually do? What am I proud of? What am I not proud of? How did I lead people? How did I follow people? If I live today over again, John, what would I have done differently? And then the last one is if I have tomorrow, and I realize, John, sooner or later I won't, but if I do have tomorrow, and I'm a value-based leader based on what I learned today, how will I operate differently tomorrow? Taking some time, John, as you said, to get away from the noise, get away from the devices, and figure out what really matters and why. Yeah, and, and I think I, I, I totally agree. But as you say, we're, we almost in work and we celebrate frenetic activity, right? So um, that's one of the first places I think, obviously, you need to look at and, and as you say, separate activity from productivity. And, and I guess that's probably one of the greatest challenges to a leader is to, is to not fall into that trap of feeling comfortable because there's so much going on. Absolutely, John. And again, it isn't a question of how much you're doing or are you doing the right things. And this whole issue is very interesting because people would say to me, boy, for a guy who studied mathematics and economics and calculus, I mean, boy, uh, this self-reflection thing, John, sounds, sounds a little uh, 
uh, up there in the clouds. Why is it so important? And I try to convince John that if you're really talking about leadership, everything around leadership starts at self-reflection. And Here's a little three-part uh, equation, John, you may appreciate it, and with no numbers. It goes like this. Part one, if I'm not self-reflective, if I'm not, is it possible for me to know myself? I don't think so. Second part, if I don't know myself, is it possible for me to lead others? I don't think so, right? So this whole idea, if I can't lead others, how can I possibly lead an organization? So it really does all start with your ability to lead yourself and to figure out what's important and what's not important. And how do you do it in a balanced way? How do you do it in a balanced way? And, and part of that, what you described, is part of that is... Uh, an element of self-awareness, right? And that is, and you can't obviously be self-aware without being self-reflective. Exactly. It, one is a journey to the other, right? Exactly. Uh, the whole purpose of being self-reflective is that you can become self-aware and know yourself. What matters to you, okay? How do you, and how do you balance things, John? Look, let's face it, as leaders, we're trying to balance our career, our family, our spirituality, our health, having a good time, uh, making a difference in the world the short time we're passing through. And very often, John, I'm sure you see this, very often people will say to me, boy, Harry, uh, I'm having trouble balancing these things. I'm really having trouble balancing. And what I remind people is most people, John, who have trouble balancing things haven't been self-reflective enough to figure out what they're trying to balance. How, how can you balance it if you haven't figured out what really matters? Exactly. And and if you if otherwise you're kind of outsourcing your life to fate in many ways you're just letting things unfold and happen rather than taking a little bit of control and as you say actually understanding what is important to you and i think that and again as i said i think this is this is becoming more and more critically important because it does run counter to the kind of world we live in now which is all very impulsive reactive immediate but what's, what's very interesting, John, you're absolutely right. But what's interesting is I'm talking to a lot of the younger students now, uh, the people at Northwestern Kellogg, where they've gone to school for four years, they've worked for five years, now in their late 20s, they're coming back. And we have some very interesting discussions, John, of, hey, is it just simply success or is it significance? All right. Is it all about your resume or is it a little bit about your legacy? Well, what difference do you want to make? And I think a lot of these younger people are watching what happened to their parents and they're saying, well, you know, they collected a lot of phenomenal material things, but has that really brought them any happiness, right? What am I doing and why? What, what is the purpose? And I think that's, um, and I think that is, uh, is certainly a challenge, I think, for organizations going forward, uh, how they can organize themselves to, to provide some of this additional value to, to their employees. And plus, I think the other part I think is just really interesting, how it really fascinates us here, is the changing, not just the changing nature of work, but the changing uh, structure of work, the fact that now people can live and operate pretty much wherever they want to be. They can be completely mobile. They don't have to be tied to a place, tied to a physical building. All of these things, I think, are really going to challenge leadership going forward as how you harness all the benefits of this uh, without, you know, without collapsing in chaos. Exactly. Well, and again, it comes back to what we mentioned before, John. If, if I've got a group of individuals, if, in case of Baxter, I had 52,000 team members around the world in 100 and some countries, all right, unless there is a way to thoroughly communicate, let people know you really care about them. Every single person matters. Um, and finding ways to let them know how much you care, th there's no way you can have a successful organization. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and again, that, uh, that you can have 52,000 people stuck in one building and be completely disconnected from them or 52,000 people spread around the world and be very connected to them because they really know who you are, right? Exactly. And it, John, it's all about letting them know, you know, you're not some lofty figure way up there, okay? It really is this ability to realize, it sounds so trite, John, every single person matters. And finding ways, John, to forget about titles, forget about that, because when you really think about it, Leadership has nothing to do with titles and organizational charts, right? I have a very simple model, John. Everything about leadership has something to do with the ability to influence people. And the only way I know how to influence people is you have to be able to relate to them. So if I can relate to you in a respectful way and you trust me, 
Maybe I can influence you, and if I can influence you, and I can lead you. And a lot of people, John, will say, well, everybody's important, everybody's important, but they don't really live that, right? I, I can give you a million of examples. I, even when I was the CEO of Baxter, if I would go into the cafeteria, John, and on the bulletin board, I would see that there's a softball game for the summer interns. I had my baseball glove and sneakers in the back of the car. I'd show up, I'd run out the left field, I'd slide in and some person would say, hey, be, be easy, that's the CEO. Like, what are you talking about? I take my hat off, it is the CEO, right? And I learned more, John, about what was going on in the company, having pizza with these interns, than I ever did for my own vice presidents. And it's interesting, as you well know, it's not as if the vice presidents weren't doing a good job, but it was a little bit of, well, you know, we don't need to get Harry involved in that. We can take care of that. I'd always say, no, Harry'd like to know what the heck is going on. And <laughs> your ability to relate to people and feel like every single person matters has an enormous impact, John, as you know. Yeah, and obviously a huge part of that is that every single person understands how their job contributes to the overall success of the organization. Because I think that's sometimes where, where organizations uh, fall down is where they don't spend, take the time to help people see and communicate uh, what, which part they're playing and how that is helping the organization. As you say, it could be down to the intern, but as long as you say to them, this is, this is how your contribution matters. John, that is so critical, right? Because in any organization, in fact, if I was in the room with you, uh, and I'd show you my favorite chart, John, it's a series of vertical parallel lines. And all those vertical parallel lines, you can call them divisions, business units, functions, geographies. Some people, John, could call them silos, all right? And you're in a, a silo. And the whole ability of management, John, is to draw a circle around all that and say, wait a minute, how, regardless of what division I'm in, function, geography, how does what I do impact what the organization is trying to do overall. And if I can understand how I fit into that and my teams fit into that, in fact, sometimes, John, I would bring in different functions, different geographies, get them in the same room, and I'd say, you know what? We're gonna have a little bit of fun today. We're gonna actually pretend, John, we all work for the same company, okay? Wouldn't that be amazing, all right? And so getting people to understand that has an enormous impact because now we're a team. Now we're really a team. Yeah, no, I did, it's, it's so incredibly important. A, a number of years ago, and I was running a couple of organizations, um, one of the things that I did was make sure that we could get our whole strategy for the following year onto one piece of paper in a graphical format. And then I, to be honest, I lamin had it laminated and sent to everybody in the company and said, put that at your workspace. And I said, here's the other part. If on a, any given day, you can't relate what you are doing to what's on that laminate. I want you to tell your, ask your manager why you're doing it. Perfect, perfect. You know, it's funny, John, as you're saying these things, it always reminded my very favorite Mark Twain quote, okay? In a speech supposedly in San Francisco, he said, you know what, if you stop and think about it, he said, everything is common sense. The problem, the problem is that common sense is not common. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a great way to, to wrap it up today, um, Harry, because yeah, that, that is the trouble with, with common sense. It really isn't that common. And to be honest, you know, there's a lot of things are pretty simple. We just do a really, really fantastic job of complicating them. Well, you know, I'll tell you, John, we'll end with this one. Uh, you just made the magical word for me. When somebody asks me when I'm trying to hire people as leaders, what's the first thing I think about is, are they capable, John, of keeping it simple? Are they capable? And somebody will walk in. Somebody will come into my office and they'll say, Harry, I need to talk to you. This is very, very complicated. And what I'll usually say is, I got a better idea, John. Why don't you go back to your office? Why don't you try to figure out how to make it simple? And then we'll deal with it. And they'll say, but Harry, it's complicated. And I got to remind them, you know what, John? That's why they call it work. That's why yeah. we have you. And as a matter of fact, John, if it was already simple, we may not need you. That usually works pretty <laughs> well, John. Yeah, I'm sure they go running back to their office and come back and say, hey, listen, I've just figured it out. And in fact, I don't, really need, I don't actually really need you to talk about it. All right, well, listen, this has been great, uh, Harry. Uh, before we go, just tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Sure. So, uh, John, I'm a, a clinical professor of leadership at Northwestern University uh, Graduate School of Business and Management uh, and a partner with um, Madison Dearborn. Uh, if people want additional information, John, they can just go to the website that my students set up, which is just harrykramer.org uh, related to any aspects of leadership. And great to be with you, and uh, we'll do it again sometime.
Yeah, absolutely. Again, my name is John Golden, Sales Pipe Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. Thanks, Harry. This was uh, fascinating and uh, it's fantastic work that you're doing there at, uh, at uh, the Kellogg School. Thank you, John.